What has the King of Morocco done that has shocked not only Black Africa, but the entire world? Morocco is an African country. However, people find it hard to believe because of Morocco's lighter skin and the Arab language they speak. Yet, genes say everything, and Moroccans are proven to be brothers of the Black Africans. After the coup in Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso, Black African countries like Nigeria started to leave their side. They went to even extremes and imposed sanctions, becoming Western puppets. That's what made things worse for Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, because they are landlocked, and sanctions cut them off from the entire world, especially for trade. That's when Morocco came in, surprising everyone. But what did it really do? Did it side with the ECOWAS in Nigeria, becoming a puppet or something else? Let's find out. So, how has geography become a punishment for Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso? Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, situated in West Africa, are landlocked nations lacking direct access to the sea. Due to these geographical constraints, these countries heavily rely on their neighboring states within the economic community of West African states for trade and port access. And this has become a source of problems. In response to recent military coups in these three nations, ECOWAS, as a regional bloc, imposed sanctions to address political instability and governance concerns. While these measures aim to tackle the issues arising from the coups, an unintended consequence was the suspension of trade activities, leading to economic and humanitarian crises in Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. The sanctions have disrupted trade and limited access to ports, presenting significant challenges for these landlocked countries in importing and exporting goods. The impact of the sanctions goes beyond their initial political objectives, affecting broader economies and causing hardships for the populations. Since these countries don't have ports, it means no trade at all. Earlier, the neighboring countries were assisting following agreements that allowed these countries to import and export. But after sanctions, things changed completely. These sanctions have undoubtedly resulted in economic hardship, leading to increased prices, limited access to essential goods, and disruptions in supply chains, creating significant challenges for the affected populations. Additionally, the sanctions complicate efforts to address these countries' ongoing security threats and humanitarian crises. Recognizing the complexities involved, ECOWAS has emphasized the importance of dialogue and engagement with the transitional governments in all three countries. The goal is to find solutions that address concerns about political stability and the humanitarian needs of the affected populations. In other words, sanctions are being used as a tool to pressure these countries, especially Niger, to reverse the coup. Western nations like France want this, which is why they support ECOWAS sanctions. But what have been the impacts of the sanctions on Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso? The imposition of sanctions on Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso in the aftermath of military coups has exposed vulnerabilities. The suspension of trade with neighboring eco was countries has abruptly halted economic activities significantly reducing both imports and exports. This results in soaring costs for essential items like food and fuel, putting additional strain on the already stretched budgets of ordinary citizens. Supply chains, constricted by the trade freeze, struggle to replenish essential goods, leaving stores with empty shelves and dissatisfied customers. With economic activities grinding to a halt, jobs disappear, leaving families grappling with unemployment and income loss. In terms of humanitarian challenges, a combination of escalating prices, disruptions in supply chains, and economic hardships has plunged vulnerable communities further into the depths of food insecurity. Limited access to essential medicines and healthcare services hangs the well-being of citizens in the balance. The economic fallout poses a threat to educational institutions, endangering the education and future prospects of numerous children. Security and political concerns revolve around the difficulties imposed by sanctions. 
cultivating seeds of anger and discontent among populations, potentially fueling further instability. Sanctions may act as an impediment to diplomatic engagement with transitional governments, impeding progress toward peaceful and democratic transitions. Prolonged instability and economic despair can create fertile ground for extremist groups, posing security threats to the entire region. But what has Morocco done that has attracted attention? Well, during the memorial of the 48th anniversary of the Green March, King Mohammed VI expressed Morocco's willingness to offer road, port, and rail infrastructure to Sahel countries. He urged the creation of an international initiative to grant neighboring sub-Saharan nations access to the Atlantic Ocean, believing it could bring about a fundamental transformation in their economies and the entire region. This truly can be a game changer for the entire Sahel region, not just Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. Also, it's essential that Morocco offers this access to the entire Sahel region, avoiding favoritism. It's the only way Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso can be welcomed to cooperate with other African countries, even if the major reason behind the initiative has been these three countries. The initiative is for all. You should know that despite the Sahel region's wealth in resources like oil, gold and uranium, corruption and militant threats have led to prolonged conflicts and poverty. King Mohammed VI stressed the need for a cooperative and shared development approach to address Sahel's challenges, extending beyond security and military measures. He outlined a broader strategy to establish a maritime economy along the southern Atlantic coast, aiming to make the region a hub for human interaction and economic integration at continental and international levels. It's because access to the Atlantic Ocean is of significant strategic and economic importance for the landlocked Sahel countries, including Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. In terms of trade and economic growth, gaining direct access to Atlantic ports eliminates dependence on neighboring coastal countries, reducing transportation costs and delays. This facilitates smoother trade with international partners, ultimately boosting exports and attracting foreign investment. Moreover, direct access opens up new trade routes beyond traditional partners, enabling market diversification and enhancing economic resilience. The improved connectivity with the global economy also promotes regional integration within the Sahel and West Africa, promoting economic cooperation and overall development. What's more, it can bring development and poverty reduction. Direct access to ports lowers import costs for essential goods like fuel and machinery, alleviating inflation pressure and improving citizens' affordability. The development of port infrastructure and associated industries creates new employment opportunities, bolstering local economies and reducing poverty. Additionally, improved trade facilitation attracts foreign investment in sectors such as manufacturing and processing, driving economic growth and overall development. In terms of security and geopolitical importance, direct access to Atlantic ports diminishes reliance on neighboring countries for vital imports, potentially mitigating political pressure and enhancing strategic autonomy. It also opens avenues for maritime security cooperation and participation in international initiatives fostering regional stability and addressing threats like piracy and trafficking. This development further strengthens partnerships with maritime nations, potentially leading to enhanced cooperation in areas like trade, security, and development. The Moroccan king emphasized the development of a maritime economy based on offshore natural resource exploration, investment in marine fishing, and seawater desalination to encourage agriculture and promotion of the blue economy and renewable energy. Additionally, he proposed a tourism promotion strategy for the Atlantic region, leveraging its assets to become a prime destination for beach and Saharan tourism. Later, the foreign ministers of Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali and Chad endorsed an initiative by King Mohammed VI to enhance access to the Atlantic Ocean for landlocked African nations. The project includes rehabilitating Morocco's coastline and aims to reshape the African geopolitical space. Morocco's commitment to providing infrastructure support was well received. 
with the initiative's success dependent on upgrading Sahel's infrastructure and integrating it into existing transport and communication networks. In a joint statement, the foreign ministers stressed the project's critical role in encouraging stability in the Sahel region. They announced their intention to finalize recommendations for submission to the leaders of the involved countries as soon as possible. Niger's foreign minister, Bakari Yao Sangare, expressed full support for the initiative, seeing it as reinforcing their hopes for the well-being of their populations. Sangare hoped the initiative would bring tangible benefits, including commercializing Niger's resources and accelerating cross-border trade for the mutual prosperity of Morocco and the Sahel countries. Representatives from Morocco, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, and Niger gathered in Marrakech for a ministerial coordination meeting aiming to bolster cooperation. At the core of the discussions was the initiative proposed by Moroccan King Mohammed VI in November, envisioning an international undertaking to grant the Sahel countries access to the Atlantic Ocean. King Mohammed stressed the importance of upgrading infrastructure in the Sahel nations and integrating it with existing transport and communication networks in the region to ensure the initiative's success. A released memo expressed appreciation for Morocco's commitment to providing road, port, and rail infrastructures to enhance the participation of Sahel countries in international trade. Additionally, diplomats agreed to establish a national task force in each country to facilitate the initiative's implementation. Foreign Minister Nasser Bourita of Morocco, along with counterparts Abdoulaye Diop of Mali, Bakari Yao Sangare of Niger, Karamoko Jean, Marie Traore of Burkina Faso, and Abakar Kurma of Chad, gathered to discuss the royal initiative, emphasizing regional and international collaboration to facilitate Atlantic Ocean access for Sahel nations as proposed by King Mohammed VI. The initiative aims to tackle integration and economic transformation in the Sahel countries, ultimately improving the quality of life for their populations. Burita in his address highlighted the initiative's potential as a strategic turning point, emphasizing the long-standing cooperation, mutual aid, and solidarity between Morocco and the Sahel nations. He underlined King Mohammed VI's visionary approach recognizing opportunities where others see problems and recommending fundamental treatments for real solutions. As part of this Pan-African initiative, the Mohammed Zasik Foundation for Sustainable Development has launched various humanitarian programs and missions across the continent, including establishing the Mohammed Zasik Prenatal Clinic in Bamako, Mali. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. But how have Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso responded, leveraging this initiative? Landlocked Sahel nations have endorsed Morocco's King Atlantic Initiative, expressing appreciation for the endeavor to ease their access to the Atlantic coast. Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Chad, conveyed their gratitude during a meeting hosted by Morocco's foreign minister, Nasser Bourita, in Marrakesh, underscoring the initiative's harmony with their goals for economic and social development, pivotal for stability in the broader Sahel region. Morocco committed to aiding brother Sahel states, extending access to its infrastructure, roads and ports for mutual prosperity. Foreign Minister Burita stressed Morocco's preference for investment over mercantile trade, emphasizing the significance of win-win projects and the influential role of education in sustainable development. Following the Marrakech meeting, the participating countries announced the establishment of task forces to implement the initiative. Malian Foreign Minister Abdoulaye Diop affirmed Mali's robust commitment to the Atlantic Initiative viewing it as a manifestation of Morocco's broader dedication to integrating actions for the shared aspirations of Sahel authorities and peoples. Burkina Faso's foreign minister, Karamoko, Jean-Marie Traoré, embraced the initiative as a call to acknowledge the rights and values of landlocked countries, presenting an opportunity to transform their continentality into an asset. Niger's foreign minister, Bakari Yaouz Sangare, 
lauded the royal initiative for mirroring King Mohammed VI's vision for Pan-Africanism, foreseeing prospects for resource exploitation, transformation, and regional connectivity. Chad's foreign minister, Mahamat Saleh Anadif, praised King Mohammed VI's leadership, positioning Morocco as a strategic and reliable partner for all African nations. He highlighted the Royal Initiative's alignment with Chad's regional economic integration project and expressed gratitude for the hope it instills in the region. The ongoing construction of the Dakla port was emphasized as a significant contribution to regional development, underscoring Morocco's enduring support for African countries. But what are the details of the port that will be used and is it sufficient for all countries? The Dakla port becomes the center of attention, acting as the gateway to West Africa and the Sahel. The Atlantic Initiative, led by King Mohammed VI, seeks to capitalize on the forthcoming $1 billion Dakla port, along with additional logistics and infrastructure to aid landlocked Sahel countries in accessing global trade and attaining their sustainable development objectives. The significant investment in Morocco's southern provinces, the Sahara, aims to extend benefits to neighboring Sahel countries by offering Morocco's infrastructure within the territory and beyond, promoting regional trade and economic integration. Taking inspiration from the success of the Tangier Medport, now the largest in the Mediterranean, the Dakla port project will integrate industrial free zones to attract export-oriented manufacturers. Spreading over 1650 hectares, the port will operate as a maritime transport hub for southern Morocco and West Africa, featuring a fishing and import-export port located 40 kilometers away from Dakla. Initiated in 2016, under the directives of King Mohammed VI, the project is strategically prepared to unlock the economic potential of the southern provinces and fortify ties with sub-Saharan Africa. But what are the high stakes involved in this cooperation? Spearheaded by King Mohammed Zai, the initiative seeks to position the Atlantic seaboard as a hub for economic integration with both continental and international influence. It envisions the development of a maritime economy infrastructure in southern Morocco and the establishment of a national merchant marine fleet, reflecting a comprehensive and long-term regional vision. All this makes Morocco the hub. In return, it offers the landlocked neighboring countries of Morocco access to the Atlantic something they badly need. The Moroccan king focuses on Morocco's distinctive geographical location as an Atlantic nation, offering access to Africa and serving as a gateway to American space. The Atlantic Initiative aligns with Morocco's role as a crucial hub, fostering connections not only with neighboring nations but also globally. It signifies Moroccan leadership illustrating the effectiveness of the king's approach in transforming the southern provinces into models of socio-economic development. The initiative also manifests Morocco's steadfast commitment to Africa, emphasizing the significance of South-South cooperation. The king's vision aims to enhance collaboration along Africa's Atlantic seaboard, with projects like the Morocco-Nigeria gas pipeline contributing to regional integration and ensuring secure energy supplies for Europe. In tackling the vulnerabilities of landlocked Sahel states, the King's proposals for upgrading and interconnecting road infrastructures align with the ECOWAS strategy. But that strategy is mutual cooperation, not imposing sanctions on fellow African countries whenever Western countries order. The initiative symbolizes a win-win approach to South-South cooperation, strategically positioning Morocco as a symbolic partner with its sub-Saharan neighbors. The Moroccan king acknowledged the success of Moroccan diplomacy in strengthening the country's position and thwarting adversaries' maneuvers. The focal point remains on sustaining development and modernization policies, specifically emphasizing the Moroccan Sahara. The rehabilitation of the national coastline, especially the Atlantic bordering the Moroccan Sahara, is pivotal for shaping the region into a nexus for human interaction and economic integration on the African and global stage. Hicham Moatadhed, an expert in strategic and international affairs, highlighted the strategic significance of choosing the Atlantic coast as a geopolitical reference supporting Moroccan development and collaboration with Africa, 
particularly the Sahel and Sahara countries. This focus aligns with the Moroccan vision of South-South cooperation, prioritizing collaboration and shared development over security and military measures. King Mohammed VI proposed an international initiative to provide a Sahel countries access to the Atlantic Ocean, acknowledging the necessity for upgraded infrastructure in the Sahel region. Recent investments in southern regions, including the Dakla Atlantic port and Tisnit Dakla Highway, underscore Morocco's commitment to socio-economic development. The King's vision positions the Moroccan Sahara as a dynamic and strategic space for joint Atlantic development involving African, American, and European nations. So, can Morocco unit all African countries using its diplomacy and economic cooperation? Well, despite being considered more Arab than African, Morocco knows the duty it has is to unite Africa, remove internal conflicts, and strengthen the continent. In this respect, the Moroccan king knows that robust infrastructure is crucial in fostering increased trade, economic growth, and overall development. China acts as a living example of that, which is using development as a means to expand its influence. The Moroccan strategy for regional integration draws inspiration from new generation regional processes like APEC or the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. These initiatives adopt a pragmatic and gradual partnership approach, focusing on functional cooperation areas with immediate concrete gains. The proposed approach prioritizes tangible results without delaying long-awaited outcomes. The carefully selected domains have the potential to yield concrete benefits. What's more, these projects address the infrastructure of bottlenecks hindering the development of African states, especially those in the Atlantic and landlocked Sahel region, timely given dwindling resources caused by over-exploitation and open-door policies to foreign investors. This approach is based on open regionalism, which is inclusive emphasizing the importance of fostering synergies and forming partnership connections with other initiatives and collaborative endeavors involving countries from both the Atlantic and other regions like the Sahel and North Atlantic. What's more, the light institutional structure designed by the Kingdom of Morocco for the Atlantic African States Process, AASP, featuring only a permanent secretariat and focal points, minimizes financial burdens on states and avoids disputes over institutional structures, Indeed, large logistics projects like ports, railways, highways and pipelines are of high importance and can reshape the international economy and enhance global dynamics. Among these projects, we can mention the model of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which aims to build bridges among different regions of the globe to enhance connectivity between China and Europe, Asia and Africa. In this respect, the Atlantic Initiative is an African form of Belt and Road Initiative that can expand. As a matter of fact, strong infrastructure can lead to increased trade, economic growth, and overall development. Countries with developed infrastructure are better positioned to attract investments, facilitate the movement of goods and people, and enhance their competitiveness in the global market. Only a few African countries have balanced scores in all dimensions of integration in Africa. For example, Morocco and South Africa perform well in macroeconomic integration, productive integration trade, and strong infrastructural integration. However, there is room for improvement in trade integration and the free movement of people. Within this context, the Kingdom of Morocco has formed an institutional framework to unite 23 African countries along the Atlantic coast. African Atlantic ports, particularly those in coastal countries like Morocco, hold substantial geopolitical importance for landlocked Sahel nations, serving as crucial gateways to global markets and trade facilitation hubs. Now, despite being sanctioned and deprived of access to neighboring ports, Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso can cooperate with Morocco to trade openly. And since this initiative is not exclusive to only three Sahel countries, it will inevitably lead to further cooperation, smoothening the road toward mutual growth and dissolution of temporary tensions, when such comprehensive trade routes would facilitate African countries. 
allowing them to generate more revenues. Less would be the West's influence in Africa, further uniting the African continent. What do you think? Should other black African countries follow Morocco in deciding independently about brother African countries? Isn't it true that having the same color of skin does not always mean countries will support each other? In the comment section right below, let us know your thoughts on whether Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso can come out of the crises they have been in lately after Morocco offered assistance. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, the black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.